All right. Hi, everyone. We are ready to get started. Um, as more people will be slowly coming in, um, I'm very, very excited for our speaker today, um, Mona Diab. Um, Mona and I go back a very long time. I recently told her that I will not reveal for how many years. <laughs> Um, we met each other when we were both graduate students a while back. Um, Mona is currently a professor at George Washington University, and she's also a research scientist at uh, Facebook AI. And um, she got her PhD from University of Maryland, um, and she's doing really a lot of interesting research. Um, she's been doing work in lexical semantics, um, work in multilingual NLP, machine translation, um, computational social linguistics, um, and more. So there are um, many areas in NLP where you will find her touch, like research that she has done that has influenced how the field has been progressing. Um, she's also made a lot of significant contributions to diversity and inclusion. Um, and also she's been very active in encouraging conversations on ethics and NLP. Um, there is a recent event that she organized, um, a panel at EMNLP, for those of you who are familiar with the conferences in, in the field. Um, and this was very well attended and is really just one of the ways in which she's been contributing to building these conversations, which are very important around um, ethical considerations in NLP. Um, and she's been also thinking around green NLP, which is around the, another area which I think is very important. Um, so with that, I'm very excited to have her um, share more with us about some of her recent um, work. And logistically speaking, um, people who have questions, please, you can enter them in the Q&A. Um, you should see a button at the bottom of your screen. Um, and I will try to moderate that, so um, share them with, with Mona. Um, so she's willing to answer questions during her talk. Um, but we'll also have time at the end for, for questions. With that, Mona is all yours. Thank you. Let me uh, share a screen and see how that works. Do you see my screen? Yeah, okay. Um, hi, thanks a lot for the very nice introduction. And yes, as Radha said, we go a long way back. Um, but we, we met when we were like five, right, Radha? So, uh, <laughs> so. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm really excited to be here with you today, and thanks so much for the invitation. It's really a privilege to be addressing this um, this audience. And uh, yeah, so I wanted to share with you some um, current views that have been simmering in um, the back of my mind, and also things that we are looking into um, even at Facebook. And um, it's it's really the beginnings of a conversation around um, ethical awareness and what opportunities exist for natural language generation. And specifically for this talk, I'm gonna focus on machine translation. So um, some disclaimers before I start. All the source examples are reflective of true cases, um, but with alteration for privacy and anonymity purposes. And all the machine translation output is really authentic machine translation output from industrial machine translation systems. And uh, please forgive me, some profanities and racist language does exist in some of these slides, but they're basically there to illustrate certain phenomena and they contribute to the talk. Um, so unfortunately they, they exist for a reason. Um, so what is machine translation's mission? The mission is to transcend language barriers to facilitate communication and empower people to have unimpeded knowledge or information access. It's a utility that serves people in their daily lives and it plays a pivotal role in, lives, in, in people's lives, especially in an era of ethical awareness. So what is the overarching proposal that I have today? It's to essentially adopt faithfulness as an objective for machine translation which is similar to what we have in natural language generation technologies, say, around summarization. So what does that mean exactly? It means creating evaluation metrics optimized for faithfulness and entails building faithfulness aware models and data sets. And I'm going to go into what that means, actually, knowing that this audience is a little bit mixed. So what is faithfulness in machine translation? At a very high level, it's essentially tra translating and generating translations that are exactly equivalent to the source with no alteration, no variation, no embellishment, or even you know, detraction from the, from the, so it's exactly at the same level. Um, 
Other NLG technologies, other NLG stands for natural language generation, other natural language generation technologies um, sim similar to text simplification, summarization, dialogue systems, language modeling, all of these are considered, they fall into the same basket of natural language generation. And uh, we've made some headway in, in summarization, for example, when it comes to uh, faithfulness, especially in the context of abstractive summarization evaluation. So the task there is to produce summaries based on a single or multiple documents in a collection of documents. And these faithful summaries are expected to be reflective of the source and only the source with no hallucination. And when we say hallucination, it's basically making up a um, piece of information and sharing. And it's typically done in a single language. At least this is where we are right now in terms of the technology. But mind you, it doesn't say much about coverage of all the information in the source, as long as it doesn't insert unwarranted information. So this is different from machine translation. So machine translation, you're expected to be sort of like a mirror image of what the source was about. While in summarization, the notion is a little bit easier, even though we do have ways of trying to figure out whether we've covered all the information in there. But in a way, it's less, um, it's less pronounced as, a, as an objective. So when I say an era of ethical awareness, what do I mean by that? So we have a notion of equality. So the definition actually is inspired by the Responsible AI Initiative within Facebook. Basically it caters to all groups and all languages, including the dialects and the vernaculars with the same level of service, thereby treating people equally and minimizing uh, differences in the outcome, especially when they're unjustified. There is a notion of equity, again, inspired by the definition, the working definition that we have within Facebook, essentially understanding whether there are groups that deserve special consideration and making a deliberate effort or a deliberate decision to prioritize outcomes for these disenfranchised. And of course, like every technology out there, especially given ethical parameters, we wanna make sure that we avoid harm and minimize bias and minimize misrepresentation going beyond basic equity and equality to address quality. Um, and of course, you want to increase transparency. So clearly communicate the quality reflecting our confidence in the generated text. So when we generate a translation, we want to make sure that we're basically making the recipient be aware, how confident are we in the quality of this, um, of this translation? So it's, it's very important to have this level of user transparency in the process. What is faithfulness? Faithfulness serves ethical considerations better than current common machine translation mindset. So the current mindset for those of you who are not practitioners in the field is really revolving around optimizing for what we call adequacy and fluency. So fluency means how coherent the text is, how, how does it sound? And adequacy means it's accurate to the source. It, it reflects what the source was about, to, was about in the process. Um, so let's take a look into, into this. So state of the art in machine translation today uh, so the source here is modern standard Arabic, which is a standardized form of Arabic that's re really the language of the educational system in most of the Arab countries. And the Arab countries, I mean by that, North Africa and, <clears throat> and Eastern Asia. So um, this comprises something like 23 countries, and it amounts to around 360 million people worldwide who speak this language. Uh, but ma the majority of people who speak the language speak a vernacular or speak a dialect of Arabic, as opposed to, you know, the very well edited form of the language, which is the language of education, which is typically what we refer to as modern standard Arabic, which is what I have here on the slide. But essentially, you can take my word for it, this is an excellent translation. So the translation into English, this program in America brings together local English teachers with teachers from around the world for six weeks to train them in the latest methods of teaching English. It's actually excellent, the translation. In fact, if you do a back translation from the English into Arabic, the quality of the Arabic that gener is generated from the machine translation is even better than the source. So it's written as impeccable Arabic, um, modern standard Arabic. So it's, it's really, it tells you that machine translation is, pretty, is doing pretty good, you know? So why do we even need this presentation that I have today? And I'll try to convince you that we actually need it. So let's take a look at state of the art for commercial machine translation systems. This is of, um, done by Intento, which is a company that typically does a lot of benchmarking. And in this data, they were looking at uh, the top providers of machine translation systems commercially. So everybody knows Google Translate, there's DeepL, there is uh, IBM, there is um, you know, SDL, Baidu, Sistran. So there are lots and lots of machine translation systems out there that are doing you know, a pretty darn good job. 
And they basically did a com comparison between different machine translation systems commercially available. And they looked at uh, 48 language pairs, around 900 to 3,000 sentences per pair per language direction. And they basically show you the performance on this graph. So taking a look at this, the data that was used for this, uh, for this translation. Actually, I don't know. Do you see my mouse, Rada? Do you guys see my mouse? I'm not sure. When I, when I move my mouse here, you don't see it? Oh, OK. Because it's, I, I it's reflecting. See, I can see the cursor, actually. Oh, you can see the, you can see it's the It's really okay. faded. It's hard to locate. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, OK. Here. Um, yeah, I think if you move it a little bit more, then it, it could be. Oh, uh, yeah, OK. Because I'm not sure, because it shows the funny thing is on this presentation mode, I see it on both screens. So I'm not sure where does it show up, actually, in reality. <laughs> um, so it's reflected in both of those. It's a mirror image. But at any rate, the bottom line here is that the data here is mostly from what's called the uh, workshop on machine translation, which is data collections that tend to be more like similar to the modern standard Arabic language that I mentioned to you earlier. And they used um, a pretty um, standardized uh, metric that's called the blue metric, which is essentially a metric that cover that looks at the, the overlap between a source, sorry, the translation and a reference translation that they get typically using a human uh, translator. So basically the upper bound for this task for machine translation is to compete or to have a translation that is compatible with a human translation of the original source. And the typical way of doing this is a, the metric is very famous, it's called Blue. And what Blue does, it just carry, counts with some bells and whistles, but essentially it counts how many, um, how many words and words uh, sequences are actually replicated between the source, uh, sorry, the target, which is a translation and a reference translation that was you know, gathered through humans, curated from humans. But the bottom line here, what I'm trying to show here in this slide is that, you know, um, some different, depending on the, on the language directions. So only Google, Yandex and Microsoft were, had all 48 language pairs covered. And the variation between them in terms of performance was pretty high. Like if you look at the standard deviations, uh, like the, 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 the error bars, uh, you see that the, the, the variance was, was pretty large. So um, having said that, we also looked at, this is another, um, uh, another chart that shows the uh, available MT quality for some of these directions. And the basic observations are as follows. In general, translating from a foreign language, thinking that English, if you just treat English as sort of like the, your, your baseline. And of course, there is a whole slew of conversation around figuring out that, or specifically identifying English as the reference language, because in general, it just happens to be the case because it is a language of convenience. But in general, uh, people tend to do this with re respect to English. So English being the source or the target. So in general, translating from uh, other languages to English achieved higher performance than English um, to, uh, to other languages. English to XX, meaning to other languages, is much lower for low resource languages. So, so thing, thing, languages like Turkish, uh, Korean, Arabic, uh, non-English directions, 16 out of 18, show much poorer performance. And um, out of the 12 machine translation systems considered, only a max of six systems are considered competitive, French to Spanish. The majority of the directions only had two systems that are competitive, 22 out of 48. So I remember you mentioned, I, uh, if you remember, I mentioned that Arabic was doing really well before when I said the quality of the Arabic was fantastic. And, um, and I even showed you that you know, going from English back into Arabic, what we call back translation using a machine translation system, the quality of the Arabic that was generated is even better than the source. So it, it gave you better quality Arabic in terms of the expression and the ability to do a semantic representation of the idea. Um, so where does, how does this square, right? So as I mentioned, this was well uh, formed Arabic. This is modern standard Arabic data. But in reality, the way people speak and the way people write is actually more like what we see on social media. So if you don't have machine translation, sorry, if you don't have well-formed Arabic, quote unquote, um, you're basically in, a, in, a, in dire straits. So let me give you an example. So these are examples that are taken from Arabic to English translations, English to French, Turkish to English, English to Arabic, and so on. Each row has a different direction. 
So I just wanted to show you some ideas, some uh, some examples here. So when it says uh, this um, source here, it was translated as they provided here through the link. Actually, what it was saying was apply here through the link. You can tell right away just from knowing the English that these two things are saying something very, very different. They provided here through the link versus apply here through the link. The same thing for English to French, don't forget to hit me up. It, it ends up being translated as don't hesitate to hit me versus don't forget to contact me in French. If you go down to um, actually English to Arabic, vote him out is actually translated as vote for him. And we find the same exact phenomenon in French, vote him out becomes voter pour lui, which is basically vote for him, as opposed to vote him out as in kick him out of the, the process through voting. Um, so that is not actually um, acceptable. Uh, of course, because it's giving you a reverse uh, meaning of the what's being said. And the same thing here for the last example from Arabic to English. Um, I, you know, my bitch walked down the street um, and it should be my, I walked my dog down in the street. So this translation into a profanity is a hallucination. And technically it's, you know, it's a female dog, right? But actually this translation is actually in context, sounds like it's a profanity rather. Okay. So we even find uh, uh, we even find really interesting um, uh, phenomena. So this is a study that was done uh, from people in, in, in our lab where they looked at the translation from vernaculars and they were looking specifically at African American English, where the systems were going from English to French. And then uh, when you and they plotted the and these are systems A, B, and C. Um, and they, these are commercial systems, and one of them is ours, one of them is our machine translation. And what they found is essentially um, when uh, the bleu, when the test data at test time has clearly American English, uh, uh, African American English uh, vernacular, the quality of the translation slopes down. And it's consistent across all, um, uh, all the different systems that we tested. So that tells you something about the way machine translation is not even being faithful or um, paying attention to these vernaculars. So it's a form of bias, so to speak. But why should we care? So 62% um, of adults in the United States get their news from social media, according to the study in the Pew Foundation. And the numbers of people who get their news from social media platforms in the US have, has risen you know, it's, it's on the rise on a continuous basis. And the statistics that I have here at least go until 2018. It rose in two years from 28% to 34%. But globally, 77% of the internet users rely on social media for their news. So this is an interesting statistic, especially depending on where you are. So I can speak for the Arab world where there is a lot of um, mistrust and distrust of regular news channels, like regular traditional social traditional media. So there's a lot of reliance on social media for their news. And a lot of them use translation because they want to see articles that are written in English in their native language or the other way around. You know, they want to see, you know, uh, not, not other way around, I mean, um, they want to see news um, that comes from different languages in their native language. So there is a huge dependence here. And again, if you think about um, the world, the proliferation of social media users across the world, this is another point here. Out of 7.7 .7 billion people, we know that there is around, you know, 3.96 billion users of social media. And in fact, in terms of demographics, um, the majority of people who come from um, Asia, uh, Asia Pacific, Europe, Latin America, Middle East and Africa are all in the, in the very young uh, age range. So they tend to use social media to express themselves as well. So that social media language and vernacular is in fact becoming the de facto language that's being used. So we should care about the quality of the translations that ge are generated from that. And just to give you an idea, in terms of um, scale and size, um, we generate within Facebook 20 billion, actually the number is 26 billion, 20 billion translations on a daily basis, which is a huge number. And this is across our various apps. So this Facebook feed, Instagram, um, uh, you know, workplace and so on, and Messenger and so on. So what do we want to do? We want to have an experience where you get to see pages in your native language 
uh, sorry, in different languages. And you want to see um, how a typical English speaker sees them, but also if I'm say a Turkish speaker, this is what I want to see. I want to see the translation of these pages to give me the exact same experience and um, that uh, uh, was natively in, in a different language to show it to me in my native language, say Turkish in this case. So what is the current mindset in the technology? We are currently optimizing, as I said earlier, for fluency and adequacy. What do these things mean? So fluency means that you want to have um, a very coherent text and adequacy means you want to reflect the source meaning and intent in, a, in an accurate way. So it's adequate. And when we say adequate, it means that we're looking at sufficiency, right? This is kind of the underlying assumption. The term adequate means that or it gives that connotation. And the current mindset looks like this. So you can think about it as um, you have a full signal here in the source. You have some kind of a black box, something happens, some magic happens inside, and then you get the translation on the outside. And what ends up happening is that you lose part of the signal here, if, if, that, um, if that comes across. But adequacy and fluency are very sufficient for Newswire, for this edited text that I mentioned to you at the beginning. So, you know, and there have been nice studies around this actually as, as, as recent as 2020, where they did a fantastic large study from, um, uh, it's called the Cubit, and it shows that machine translation performance even surpasses human uh, Turing tests for English to check Newswire. And this is used using, you know, state-of-the-art machine translation systems that use deep neural networks and so on. I'm, I'm not gonna bother you with, with all this information, but the bottom line is, this is pretty good, you know, so why even bother? But again, the caveat here is that this is edited text. So now, um, what do we want to go for? What's our objective? We would love to have a situation where we have a full signal on both sides. So the translation is exactly reflective of the, um, of the, of the, of the original source. And to boot, we would love to have a glass box model where we actually know what's happening. So there is a level of interpretability and a way of reasoning why what happened in the process for transformation from the source to the translation. So this is really a, a source, um, a North Star. Um, but in the absence of a North Star, let's try and think about landing on the moon. So, um, so I won't focus today on the glass door, the, the glass box model uh, for, the, for the time being. So what is faithful MT again? No, it's not about prayers and supplications. It's about producing machine translation that is faithful to the source, reflecting the exact meaning of the source with no additions, also known as hallucinations, no deletions, no egregious substitutions. So essentially, you remember that example that I had about the bitch and the dog. Technically speaking, that's a good one, but it's a, it's a substitution that's really egregious. And we want to go beyond translation means. And what it is not, it's not a judgment on the radicality of the content. So we're not saying anything about the truth value of the content. It's not a judgment on the provenance of the source. So we're not saying anything about who the source, um, who the source of the translation is. So in a nutshell, faithful translation is about achieving meaning, expression, and usage equivalence with the source while maintaining minimal distance. So in this proposal, we're creating a mindset shift. We want to move beyond the minimum viable product, uh, which is what we call an MVP in industry, from going from that minimum viable product mindset to adopting a faithfulness mindset. And this is kind of reflective in the terminology that we are using when we say adequate. So adequate means you know sufficient, but is it really faithful? Actually, this is what we'd like to address. So we want to go beyond the adequate meaning and fluency to include usage considerations. Example is specifically what I mean by that is pragmatics. So emotional intensity reflecting trends as they have downstream implications, level of formality, coherence in a post is part of the message, um, use of idiomatic expressions, conveying cultural nuance, hedging in a message has implications like for deception detection, for example, sarcasm, irony, example, humor versus hate speech detection. So these are some of the things that we would like to be, you know, modeling and like to be uh, reflective. So especially pertinent, I believe, in social media and opinion data. So this type of subjective data is full of nuance that cannot be ignored. So there are messages associated with these things. And what are the potential implications of shifting our mindset? If we adopt faithfulness mindset, it allows us to think of other approaches to evaluation, typically task-based evaluation. 
So as I, if you remember, the way we do evaluations was using this blue metric, which basically looks at word overlap and sequences of word overlaps between a source and a target, sorry, a target and a reference. But now if you adopt this, then potentially we could open up other evaluation rubrics. And it becomes a forcing function toward building more interpretable models. So basically, this is the new paradigm that I'm proposing, which is basically looking at faithfulness as sort of like an overarching umbrella over faith, fluency, and adequacy. But there's also another notion that needs to be addressed here, which is the notion of plausibility. What is plausibility? So plausibility beyond fluency. Plausibility refers to how likely is this translation to appear in a target language. So this is just an example, you made my day. And in Arabic, it says, which basically verbatim means you built or manufactured my day. It's fluent Arabic, but it's not quite, a, it's not quite plausible. But, so essentially, it's, it's really a weird way of saying you made my day. A correct faithful translation would be something like you made me happy, uh, which is an Egyptian Arabic uh, translation. Faithfulness beyond fluency. Typically, we aim for fluency in the target, almost ignoring source fluency. However, in social media, speech effects play a pragmatic role. So for example, if you have something like, I love football, and you see here, it has this, um, uh, I should have highlighted this in red. It has, oops, um, sorry. Um, it has an elongation, what we call it. So the W, so it says, like this, and should be translated something like, I love football. So having this level of exaggeration is also indicative of a pragmatic role. So it says something about emphasis, it says something about what's important in the message. So that is lost in translation. If you just say, I love football, it's really a bland translation. It's not really reflecting the, the, the emotion intensity of the, <coughs> excuse me, it's not reflecting the emotion intensity that's trying to be, you know, conveyed in the way they express the original source language. So being aware of this. So this is faithfulness beyond fluency. Fluency would tell you to say, I love football and just stop there. But reality is, you know, you want to make sure that you get the pragmatic effect um, on, the, on the target. So faithfulness beyond adequacy. So for example, here is an example that says, um, which means the adequate translation is the dress is nice, it will eat a piece from you, which is really a verbatim translation. But in reality, the faithful translation would have been something like the dress is stunning, it really fits you nicely. So that difference between adequacy and faithfulness tells you, gives you a nuance and gives you a sense of what's being said. Same thing here, the president is close to his people. Um, an adequate translation would say something like Ra'is Qarib min Shabu. Qarib means close physically. Um, and you could you could argue that this is could be has a, a physical uh, interpretation, but in reality, um, the given the given a context, an appropriate context, you want to say something like the president is is admired by his people, and the translation would be something to the effect of admiration as opposed to physical closeness. So having this distinction um, is beyond adequacy, and it's it it reflects it is a true reflection of what's being said. So what also, just taking into consideration what throws users off, we know this from user studies that we've done, uh, both academia and industry, are things like catastrophic translations. So if you have a named entity, like a proper name, and it gets a bad translation that throws users off, people are not, they don't trust the machine translation anymore. So something like SimSim is a person's name, it gets translated as Sesame, and it should have been translated as, should have been kept as SimSim, recognizing that it's a, a named entity that should not be, a proper name that should not have been translated, should have been transliterated. You get wrong pronouns, so it and he instead of a she. Deleting critical information, false profanities, the dog becoming a bitch, implausible translations, made my day, you know, becomes something like realize my day or manufactured my day, which is a bizarre translation. Introduction of virant terms, so oppose them becomes attack them. And this actually happened uh, in a translation from Facebook, which led to somebody getting arrested back in, I think it was 2019 where um, a translation from English to Hebrew uh, in Israel um, had a translation going from, as opposed to saying good morning, it became attack them, and the person got arrested for that. Um, reversing the polarity, vote him out, vote comes vote for him, as opposed to vote him out. Hallucinating unwarranted target text. So um, the first three, 
could be satisfied if you just optimize for adequacy, but the rest of them are faithfulness issues that need to be addressed through faithfulness. And while reverse polarity could argue that, you know, if you have a good adequate system should also capture, capture that. Um, but currently the current technology maybe addresses these first three within the current rubric uh, and the rest is considered really nice to have. So back to our, um, you know, state of the art on social media, if you look at this chart that I, I, I shared with you earlier, um, the top three and maybe the, the, you know, these two are definitely things that adequacy can handle or would aim to handle. But um, from, um, you know, this example here, where basically it says super relate silent treatment to the max. Uh, the translation that we got from machine translation today is super is calling silent treatment to the extreme. While the real translation should have been something like I'm with you um, and just ignore, you know, it, th this should have been the right translation. So this is definitely something that cannot be handled just if you just have adequacy alone. So faithfulness has to play a part here. Same thing with the last example that has to do with my walking uh, down the street with my dog. So if our MVP is not there, so if you say, you know, okay, this is the state of the art of machine translation for social media, why even think of faithfulness? Why not we just focus on getting adequacy completely done, completely solved, and just think of faithfulness later? You know, it becomes a luxurious thing. Maybe once we solve the fluency adequacy problem, then think of faithfulness. Isn't, think, isn't faithfulness a luxury and nice to have? I argue not, especially in subjective data, social media and opinion data where um, pragmatics are crucial. For example, the super related to silent treatment to the max, super is calling, it's a weary, really weird translation. But you know, the, the other one, um, walking the dog down the street, same thing here. So what are the challenges of pragmatic phenomena? Many of these pragmatic phenomena are high type, low token frequency, which means what? They are expressed with very high variability. So think about proper names idiomatic expressions, neologisms, hashtags. These are all phenomena that exist, but the way they're expressed is very variable. They are very nuanced. They're very, um, they don't exist with a very, um, uh, you know, um, uh, typified way. And social media seems to expedite these new expressions being coined in the language. So they're very dynamic and they tap into generation Z's creativity. And the problem is even worse for low resource languages, such as dialectal variants. So when we say low resource, that means um, a languages that don't have many digitized forms, or even if they do exist in a digitized form, they don't have ways to process them. So we don't have tools that are good enough to, you know, to handle them. And the current computation linguistic technology challenges are, are still you know, relatively young. So things like negation detection, understanding when the vote him out versus voter pour lui are really against each other. So knowing that these, this is, they, there's a reverse polarity that happened there. If you don't just don't have the very simple not and didn't and so on. Sarcasm detection, humor detection and translation. This is something that Rada has worked on humor for some time, which is really fascinating work. Quantifier scope and so on. So what would it take to get there in order for us to achieve this vision that I'm, I'm trying to, to push here in this, in this talk? We'd like to address style correspondence. So for example, hey, you all, what's up? So you wanna get a faithful translation, which is basically, so in the blue here, it says, hello guys, uh, what, what's up? As opposed to the adequate translation, which tends to be more modern standard Arabic, more stylized, more formal. Addressing emotion intensity. Um, sometimes I like to eat sushi for dinner would become, I love to eat sushi for dinner for hours, uh, which is the uh, adequate translation, which is really a verbatim translation, as opposed to what I, you know, what the original was saying. Um, addressing modality, um, the belief modality specific, which is essentially th something like this. GM may lay off workers, it gets translated as GM might lay off workers versus the current adequate translation, which says GM will lay off workers. And if you subject this to our current evaluation frameworks, it's considered completely fine. I mean, a will versus a may, it's not a big penalty, even though in reality, it makes a huge difference and it makes a huge difference. And it has, I don't need to convince you that this could have a spiraling downward effect. 
addressing hallucinations, especially around profanities. So when it says, um, the poor are demanding their rights in America, the deplorable people are demanding their right to life in America. So having like um, uh, an adequate translation, as unfortunate as it is, might in, in our current uh, evaluation frameworks would be considered okay. Um, addressing idiomatic expressions, multi-word expressions, um, in the, a faithful translation, it's basically translated as, um, if you do a, an adequate translation, did you see where Arab money goes outdoors? You get the gist of what's being said. A real good translation would be something like people. Did you see where Arab wealth goes? The into thin air, which is really like addressing the, it gets the nuance of what's being said in Arabic into a, an exact nuanced variation in, in, in English. Addressing sarcasm. Wow, what audacity, dude. But in the adequate translation is, oh, peace be on your daring attitude, bro. In a way, it's adequate. It says what, you know, you sort of get what the gist of what the Arabic was supposed to say, but it doesn't give you the full, um, again, palette of what's being expressed in Arabic. Um, addressing code switching. So you remember that example with um, they arrived here through the link. It should have been applied here through the ring, through the link. Addressing code switching, like sovgardit il walaf, save the file versus I saved the file. Um, what would it take to get there addressing other phenomena such as shorthand, uh, neologisms like frenemy and move, hashtags, humor and irony, negation, quantifier scope, etc. So what are some of the modeling considerations that we that we should be taking into consideration when we deal with this? Addressing pragmatics and machine translation. There are some technologies right now where we look at data augmentation for specific phenomena. There's work by uh, Zaninello and Birch around multi-word expression aware machine translation. Um, and this was doing it from English to Italian, where they looked at different approaches around augmenting training data with multi-word expression, uh, parallel data, uh, looking at leveraging multi-word expression detection tools, applying factored neural machine translation, as well as back translation. Back translation meaning uh, you give me um, data in English, say English to Arabic, and then um, you take the English to Arabic system, um, sorry, Arabic to English system, you translate some of the data that comes out into the, the source language and you re-inject it into your training uh, protocol. And it shows that back translation yields the highest results. Uh, <clears throat> there are some also effort and work around controlled formality generation in the context of machine translation. The work by uh, Neo et al, um, in, uh, where they looked at, um, uh, you know, doing control generation using multitask learning approaches, and they achieve uh, good results com comparable to other technologies that are around side constraints and so on. There is also uh, work around hallucination detection, detection. So when the machine translation uh, or neural generation produces things that were not even in the source, so hallucinated things, like it, it just added uh, profanities or added um, you know, pieces of, pieces of data that were not even attested in the source. So this is work that we have uh, worked on um, this uh, within Facebook, again, towards safe generation, where we looked at detecting hallucination in neural sequence generation, for both machine translation as well as summarization. And the approach that we did was we did unsupervised learning of hallucination prediction. And we created synthetic supervised data and we did some fine tuning. But essentially, we were able to um, improve the quality of the machine translation by basically in, involving this sort of module that is able to detect when there is a hallucination in, in uh, going on. And again, there are lots of other enabling technologies such as style transfer using supervised and supervised and semi-supervised methods. There's work going on around emotion intensity classification, sarcasm detection, levels of committed belief, uh, like what I talked about with the GM will fire versus um, GM may fire. So that distinction is a, is a committed belief distinction. So, um, you know, this is really interesting that there is some effort there. Um, and similarly for negation detection, multi-word expression classification, interest and tension code switching, and various integration modeling techniques, like side constraints, augmentation, multitask learning, and so on. But majority of these systems exist for English, or at best high resource languages. So, and already machine translation as it is, remember that report that I showed you from Intento, where English is sort of like the center of the universe. So it is the reference language. 
and most in most directions lack direct L1 to L2 data. Meaning if you want to translate between Arabic and Turkish, you have to typically go through some kind of pivot language and that in general tends to be um, uh, tends to be English in general, which says something. So, you know, at, at face value, maybe that's a good viable solution, which is okay. The problem with this is that say, for example, Arabic is rich in terms of morphological expression. So it, it expresses, you know, um, feminine gender uh, versus masculine gender in explicit terms, while, Arab, while English is le a level, be, uh, you know, underspecified beyond that. So say I want to translate from English, say, to Russian, sorry, from Arabic to Russian, and I go through English, a lot of that signal gets lost in translation through that pivoting. So when I'm generating between Arabic and Russian, I end up getting the wrong you know, pronouns, for example, which is a big deal, in fact, and something that turns off people from translation. So having that notion is very important. So basically, one possible solution uh, in mitigating this English-centric bias is to increase the language, the pool of pivot languages with various language family representatives. So there are around 13 to 14 language families, um, but we basically want to focus on heeding some of the um, following characteristics, essentially having typologies that are widespread and make sure that these pivot languages and the representative of each of these families is high resource enough with as much resources as in like digitized data as, as possible. And essentially exploiting language relatedness in, in more creative ways. So we had done some work where the work on the dialectal side, the dialects of Arabic are considered low resource while modern standard Arabic is considered high resource. So how could we bridge that gap using exploiting the fact that there are lots of commonalities and cognates that are shared across languages? Um, there are also evaluation considerations. So um, as I mentioned to you, the current paradigm revolves around Bleu and variations of Bleu. So just to give you an example here, this is a human translation. I did not go to the office. If machine translation one has, I have not been to the office, it's rated as much lower then machine translation two, which is I did go to the office, which is an exact opposite of the human translation, sorry, of the human reference. But the, 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 the issue is, the, if you just look at Bleu, uh, which is basically word overlap, the machine translation two has a lot more commonality between, uh, uh, in terms of number of words than uh, machine translation one. So therefore it's the winning one. So desiderata, what do we want to do? We want to create target data sets that reflect relevant faithfulness phenomena. We want to develop metrics that focus on equivalence, optimizing for faithfulness rather than translation ease. And there is one viable option out there, which is semantic textual similarity, which is an established metric, not metric, but yeah, evaluation framework that we've had in the literature for the past at least nine years. And it minimizes reliance on references. We want to have grounding uh, evaluation user studies on a continuous basis. We'd like to invest in automated, relevant enabling technologies like hallucination detection and so on. And we would want to adopt a task-based evaluation paradigm such as question answering to address critical errors and so on. So evaluation data sets mitigating gender bias. So there is some work actually out there where, uh, because as I mentioned earlier, in fact, and we just did this test with uh, some of the translation systems out there beyond what I have on the slide here, where um, you give the, uh, the machine translation system sentences from a Finnish and Swedish, where they have the pronoun han, H-A-N with the umlaut um, and, and so on, which is basically a genderless um, pronoun, which typically is equivalent to they or them. And it consistently translates um, like, he, um, you know, he uh, plays sports versus she washes the dishes. And um, this is, you know, it's really interesting to see that the, the, the biases that we, we observed in, in that. So what we wanted to do was evaluation data sets that could mitigate these gender biases is by, gener you know, creating data sets that have gender balance generation. So this is work by Haba Shitol, um around where they basically uh, created data sets that showed this balance so that you can get an evaluation framework that is not biased in one way or the other. Um, again, a lot of these solutions and considerations are for higher resource languages, but where are ethical considerations of equity and equality? So there is some effort that's happening around low resource machine translation. 
And essentially, we were in the process at Facebook of creating data sets. So there was the work that came out in 2019 from the Flora's um, evaluation data sets, which basically looks at really, really low resource languages and putting these data sets out in the public for people, for, for, for people to use. Um, and also there is an effort around multilingual training, which essentially it focuses on um, you know, these very, very low resource languages. So just to give you an idea, uh, this translation, so I, I want to do this in a, in a uh, so the data side, so in general, the way we do machine translation is that we have trans uh, data for training that typically comes from data in translate, uh, like parallel data. So think about the Bible, where you have an English book and a Hebrew book and an Arabic book, exactly the same translation of each other. These are parallel data. And uh, what we have here are the sizes of these training data that we have for Marathi, Gujarati, Mongolian, Azerbaijani, Bengali, it has around 10,000 sentences, which is in, in machine translation parlance today, very, very low resource, very little data. And then you have the next tier up would be Thai, Indonesian, Swedish, Portuguese, Hossa, uh, Macedonian, it goes from 10,000 to around 100,000 sentence pairs um, for uh, data sizes of 10, 100,000 to 1 million, like Tamil, um, and for 1 million to 10 million, you have Finnish, Hindi, Estonian, 10 million plus would be German, French, Spanish, Russian, and all of these are to English, right? So these are translation pairs to English. So what people have done there was essentially um, compare, like if you do training with different protocols where you have bilingual training, where you have a system that's trained on just the bilingual data alone, you get this baseline. And then if you do multilingual training, which is essentially putting all the data together and doing you know, nifty techniques around it, the ones, the language pairs that benefit the most are those with very low resource languages. So the 4K to 10K and the 10K to 100K, the, the rise goes from 11.6% um, uh, 11 uh, blue points goes up to 18.9% and 16.8% goes up to 22.3%. So we see increase across the board, but especially for low resource languages, which is basically languages that are spoken by people who don't have enough resources um, for getting digitized content, they benefit the most. So some of these technologies play that role of equity and equitability, raising the, the services for these um, for these language pairs. Of course, in, in the absolute terms, these numbers are still very low, like 18.9, 22.9, let alone 3.9, 3.8. That's actually a not, not a very um, high um, um, uh, improvement technically per se. Um, so what are the open challenges and opportunities to the community? What does it mean to really model fluency? That's a big challenge. What does it really mean to model humor that doesn't transfer over? Um, how do we deal with neologisms, new selfie, frenemy, typos in the source? Do we keep them? Do we remove them? Do we fix them? Um, are they conveying a certain, you know, if somebody think about a psychology, um, like, you know, for mental health, if you're doing translation for mental health and you have a patient, if they're dyslexic, maybe you want to be translating the dyslexia, you know, because in, in the absolute, of course, nobody wants to see typos. But in reality, if the typo is telling you something that could help with the diagnosis, for example, um, maybe that's something that you want to maintain. So having that ability to maintain that might, might serve a purpose. Shorthand, hashtags. How do we handle code switching in the input? How do we generate code switching where appropriate to make it more natural? How do we, set, how do we handle sourcing coherence? Um, reference translations are complicated to generate, especially for low resource language scenarios and dialects resulting in evaluation implications. So how do we deal with that? Um, so some of the take home messages that I'd like to leave you with um, is essentially my big message is let's rise above the inherent mediocrity of, a, of, a, of an MVP. And I think I'm leaving you with a lot of answers than questions, uh, sorry, questions than answers. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I think shifting our mindset to consider faithfulness as necessary and not optional. I want us to keep our eye on the ethical dimensions of our solutions and potentially a mindset shift from only optimizing for fluency and adequacy to optimizing for faithfulness. Might result in a hybridization of minimal feature engineering, a representation lending a hand to interpretability. Remember that glass box? I want us to be creative about our evaluation. And again, grounded in user experience. 
And I believe this is this takes a whole, you know, a village. So a three-day concerted community effort is needed to get there. Um, again, thank you very much for listening for this long and uh, that let the conversation begin. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Mona. Um, this is fantastic and very insightful talk and really got me thinking oh, and I'm you. sure it got the other people in the audience thinking about what we really need to optimize for. Um, and there are a couple of questions which I'll um, move on to asking, but a reminder to the audience to please um, type your questions in the Q&A section. Uh, you'll find it at the bottom of your screen. So there is one question um, about um, whether we should show the uncertainty of this system to users and whether that would be helpful. Also offering the question is also uh, pointing out to uh, perhaps um, we are too far from that point in the sense that um, we are too far from faithful translation, so maybe showing uncertainty doesn't really help. Uh, but it would be interesting to hear your view on whether a reflection of system uncertainty would, would be helpful. I totally believe in that. So this is something that uh, we, we're talking about a lot um, in various circles around showing the, the, the confidence levels. First off, it's not easy to measure the confidence levels of the systems, right? So you can, you can most of our systems now are deep learning methods and um, even machine learning methods. So what do you show as the confidence level? Um, so I believe it would gain people's trust. It would, it would, sorry, earn people's trust if they see and they can tell that you know what, take this with a grain of salt and this would be an indicator toward that. Now we've made some headway. So uh, there is some headway that, that's been happening in the literature around quality estimation and competence estimation models. And they, they tend to be a good reflection. Um, there are ways to go obviously, but it's something that's been um, you know at least part of a shared task over the past couple of years around uh, in WMT in the workshop for machine translation and evaluation frameworks. So there is a lot of research that goes into that, to that line of work. But again, um, surfacing that to the user would definitely gain their trust and you know, shows that, you know what, don't trust what we have here or trust it and so on. So, excuse me. <clears throat> so yes, I'm, I'm a, a believer in working towards uh, surfacing confidence, uh, confidence levels. Now, the next question is, um, do we do that even if we're not in the faithful you know trend yes so what so there's there's a notion of mystification that we need to dispel so you know what you get to see from google translate for example uh, well i i don't mean google i don't want to be picking on google translate i mean let's say commercial translation systems out there is that uh you know they give you the translation and if you're not really a bilingual speaker you would tend to believe whatever they tell you and you have no way of telling that this is um, less or more uh, than the quality of the translation, even from us on a systems basis level. So my thinking is um, it would go a long way to get pe to to have people trust that when we don't know something, we are very upfront about it. And I think that's that that would be um, a plus, not a minus. Thank you. Um... There is another question. So the previous question was from Jonathan Kummerfeld. Um, there is another question from Do Junmin on um, whether an automatic evaluation method for faithfulness or for other linguistic pragmatic um, aspects would be necessary to achieve faithfulness in NLP. Yes. And oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> there is another question that is um, also thinking of the fact that maybe we focus on adequacy because it's easier to measure. But if we want to measure, so if we want to optimize for faithfulness, would we need an automatic evaluation method for that in the first place before we can deeply delve into that research direction? Yeah, I like I like this line of thinking because that's aligned with me, of course, I'm biased. So typically you want to develop the metrics first before even um, thinking about, um, so you want to identify what the phenomena are, develop the metrics and data sets, uh, associated with them and then figure out the modeling that goes with that. So uh, it's a whole ecosystem. And it, essentially, yes, we, of course, I'm, we do human evaluations, but they tend to be extremely expensive. So we would want to have a correlate of the, 
that is something that would be more sensitive to these phenomena that, I'm, that I, I, outline, uh, I outlined. So, so yes, I would definitely say we definitely have to have metrics. And this, this basically, what I'm proposing here is a whole enterprise. And uh, it would need a concerted effort, as I mentioned, of people working on metrics, people working on models, people working on data sets and data set curations, identifying the phenomena that are tractable versus not tractable. So all of that plays a big role, absolutely. So there are um, also a couple of questions from anonymous questions on, um, I would put them more broadly about the, how Facebook sees their role in responsible or ethical AI. Also with a view to um, how it aligns with what is being done in practice. Like there is the research of course, and the, the more practical application. And this is to the extent that you can speak about it. I know there are certain things that yeah. you cannot really speak. Um, yeah. So actually, we just had an article that dinged Facebook, came out of MIT Press Review <laughs> a week ago uh, around responsible AI, but it, it does say what we're doing there. So there is a huge initiative internally within Facebook around responsible AI. And the focus has been on responsible AI, specifically around fairness and bias, um, and coming up with metrics associated with those two, but also looking at robustness, looking at safety, you know, minimizing harm and uh, the interactions between whatever we produce in terms of systems and um, say integrity work. So knowing you know, if there is misinformation, disinformation, harm um, and so on. So there is a huge effort and a big shift towards that within, within the company. And I'm gonna stop here because I can't say anything more. <laughs> yes, and that's also a perfect time to stop. Uh, we are right at 5 p.m. And so thank you again so much for a very insightful presentation and again for getting us to think about these new directions um, in, in machine translation and how it relates to ethical AI and thank you to the audience for, for being here. Thanks a lot for having me. Thanks and zoom so up to the audience as well. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Bye everyone. Bye.